Our Father God, again, we come to you today thanking you for the many blessings and for the many surprises today, Father, that you have brought our way. And Father, we have come through the snow and through the, uh, all the different inclement weather, Father, to be here, to fellowship with one another and to praise your name and to bring honor and glory to your Son. And Father, we know that there are brothers and sisters who have suffered far more than we have and that there are suffering right now in this present time all over the world. And Father, our hearts go out to them as we pray for them. And Father, our hearts are filled with anguish and sadness of their suffering and persecution that they're going through. And we lift them up to you today, Father, that you might bring your spirit to them in a very special way and that you would undergird them with your strength. And we ask, Father God, that as we come anticipating your presence here today, that your Holy Spirit would have a free reign on each and every heart. That every heart would be open in anticipation, Father, of your blessing. That every heart would be open to be filled and to be overflowing, Father, as we leave this place. Let this, your word, Father, do not come, come not back to us void. But you've promised us, Father, that it would be a blessing to each and everyone who heard. And so, Father God, bless us today with your word. Teach us with your Holy Spirit and give us strength. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. To the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 30, and we're going to continue with the saga of Jacob. You know, if there is one word that I would have to use to summarize the life of Jacob in the aspect of the good and the bad and the ugly, many years ago there was a spaghetti western called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And, you know, I think it basically talked about how life could be sometime for the Christian. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Jacob was a man of the world. Though he had listened many times to the great teachings of his fathers, there while residing in the tents while his brother Esau ran off into the countryside and did his hunting thing. Jacob was the one who decided that he would stay and listen to the word of God. And so therefore Jacob was the one who was bent towards that direction. And God met Jacob at Bethel on his way to meet his bride. What a place to meet God. Imagine going to find a bride and finding God. And there Jacob found God and God changed Jacob there and Jacob began to do differently with his life. And there he went to go reside with Uncle Laban who was the greater schemer of them both. And Jacob in his early Christian life, so to speak, was trying to amend his ways and trying to do what he could and the watchword for Jacob's life would be trust. He had to learn to trust God. And I think God brought Uncle Laban into the life of Jacob so that Jacob would learn to trust God. We see Jacob here. We see Jacob being blessed. We see Jacob with God's hand of mercy and grace upon him. And whatever he is doing, God says, I'm going to bless it. Last time we see Jacob, he was making a deal with Uncle Laban. Someone should have said to Jacob, be careful. Someone should have said to Jacob, you better get this in writing. Because Uncle Laban, the schemer, was waiting, was he not? Some might have seemed that Jacob was naive. But I think Jacob was, as a new Christian, trying to do the best he could and Laban, as the great schemer, was doing the best he could also. And behind every dark cloud, as Laban would say, is an opportunity to cheat someone. And so we see Laban here willing to do his deal. God obviously had another plan in all this scheme. God had a plan for Jacob and his prosperity. God had a plan for Jacob and his life. Sometimes God's plan is seen in the today. There are times when I have seen in my own life that God has blessed me in the day in which I'm dwelling in. 
And you know what? It's a sweet thing. I like those times, don't you? I like those times when I see God's dwelling. You know, sometimes people think God is like a fortune cookie. That you break him open and you find out what's inside and you munch on the sweet stuff and then you get that little thing that says, hey, you know, help, I'm being held captive in a, in a fortune cookie factory, you know. The bottom line is, folks, God is not a genie that we rub the lamp and he gives us what we want today. Sometimes his plan is known in the today. Sometimes his, his will and his plan is known in the tomorrow. Sometimes his will and his plan is known in the future. Sometimes it seems like God is going to reveal it all when we get to be with him one day. But his plans are for our best. It's the trust factor that Jacob must learn in his early Christian life. And many of us, including myself, we did not learn those right away. And therefore, sometimes we had to go around the block twice. And when we go around the block twice, there are many times we used to say, well, God, where are you? Why am I going through this again? When God has said, listen, you haven't trust me yet. And sometimes God's plans don't seem like God's plans. Sometimes it seems like God went on vacation. It seems like God is far, far away. But in reality, he's teaching us every day and every step of our life to trust him more. We see Uncle Laban. He had his plans. Jacob had his plans. God had his plans. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. And so therefore it is to our benefit that we find out what God's thoughts are. And we find out what God's ways are, and we follow them. So how do you do that, preacher? You go up in a mountaintop, you know, I would love to be in the mountains right now. Not in the Rocky Mountains, but perhaps in one of the warm mountains somewhere, perhaps in Arizona. But I'd like to be in the mountains, and I love the mountains. I love the Smoky Mountains. People in Florida, we used to laugh because everybody would come to Florida for vacation, while the Floridians would go up north to the mountains for vacation. Well, we had to do that because with all the, the Yankees coming down, if we, if we stayed there very long, the, the whole peninsula would split off. So we had to have this, you know, occupational hazard thing. We had to have it switch off the company, so to speak. But I love being in the mountaintops. I love being in, in the times where I enjoy myself. But folks, we don't have that luxury. Sometimes God's greatest teaching is in the valley. Sometimes God's greatest teaching is in the trouble. So we're going to see two things today. We're going to see a plan for Jacob's obstruction. And we're going to see a plan for Jacob's opportunity. These two plans are going to boom, butt heads right next to each other as we see. Let's start with verse 34. And Laban said, this is speaking of, of Jacob's plans that he, that he had for Laban. And, La and Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. We see in verse 35, so he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs and gave them to the hands of his son. Remember, he said, what do you want from me? If you'll stay with me, I'll pay you anything. Jacob was going back home, but Jacob decided to do what Laban said. Laban says, you, you name it, I'll give it to you. He said, I'll take the spotted ones and the striped ones, the animals and then you can have the solid ones. And Laban says, okay, great deal. And so Laban makes his first step here. We see this in verse 34, I mean 35, he separates them. Verse 36, then he put three days journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Oh, excuse me, verse 35, so he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and the female, go female goats that were speckled and spotted and everyone had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs and gave them into the hands of his sons. And then he put three days journey between himself and Jacob and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. 
And now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and the almonds and the chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them, and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters and in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaks, speckled and spotted. And then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before their eyes and the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. And when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. Now you're saying, my goodness, what is this all about? And I'll be honest with you, my major was not in animal husbandry, so I don't know either. But I did do some research, and we're going to go through a little bit about what this is all about. First, we see the plan for Jacob's obstruction. In verse 34, look at Laban's sly pretense. Jacob says, I want to I, I, I go home. Let me go home. He says, I, I really want to go back to, to the land of my fathers. Let me go home. And, and Laban says, no, God has blessed me. I've seen him bless me because of you. So you stay here. I will pay you whatever you want. And Jacob says, you know, you give me the flocks that are spotted and speckled, and you keep the solid ones, and I'll be happy. And old Laban says, sounds great to me. Well, there's a pretense to this. Why? We see his immediate consent. Though Laban says, yes, there is no way he's going to allow this to succeed. You know, when the Labans of life say, yes, you ought to look very careful at the contract. When Laban puts a piece of paper in the front of your, your eyes and you look at it, and you're trying to, to view it, make sure you turn the page over and observe the small print. Because the Labans of life do not give anything freely. We see his disbelief of Jacob's proficiency. He says, I'm not going to allow it to happen. There's no way that Jacob can succeed in this. And we're going to see later on, possibly next week, where Jacob tells his wives, your father has cheated me. And he has. Laban was intent in cheating Jacob in this matter. So we see the disbelief of Jacob's proficiency. Folks, there are people out there that do not believe in your proficiency and they will seek to cheat you. Their whole attitude of life is to get as much out of you as they possibly can with little that they put into it. Now, there are people like that. I want you to understand, as a Christian, I would say, if, if we, as Christian, we ought to be happy with one another and be careful to, to, to not hurt one another's feelings and things like that. But once you get out in the real world, folks, that's a different place. It's a different place. We see his doubt. And many times, folks, Christians get out in the real world and they get burned and they get bitter and they get angry and they get resentful. God, why didn't you protect me? God, why didn't you take care of me? You know, God allows us to go through some things like this sometimes. That we might trust him the more. We see his doubts in Jacob's plan. If all else fails, Laban says, I'm the best of the schemers. His, prob his, his plan is going to fail. I'm going to find the loophole in it, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Obviously, Laban had forgotten his declaration. Look at, declaration. Look at verse 27 in this same chapter. And Laban said to him, Please stay, if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. You know, there are people that, that are, you are employed by that know that there's some reason God, some reason they've been blessed, their work has been blessed. You are a blessing to your boss. You ought to be. You ought to be the channel where God blesses your employer. If you're an employer, God ought to use you to bless your employees. You ought to be the channel that people look and say, you know, I'm glad they're working for me. They've been a blessing to me. My work has gotten better because of you. And that way, when they say that to you, you can say to them, you know, it's because God loves me and God loves you. And what a blessing, what a testimony that would be. Folks, listen, you don't cut Jesus off the moment you walk out this door. 
If this is your witnessing scheme here, you fall very short of what God would have for you to do. There are people where you work at that you're going to see tomorrow that are lost that need Jesus. Now, Sue and I are, are pretty well saved. I've checked Sue out for 17 years. She's been pretty good. But there are times when I've got to get out of the, out of the, the, the office. I've got to go places. I've got to see people. I've got to talk to people too. And I can be a blessing to others too. That's what God would have you to be. Don't be a burden to your boss. Be a blessing. And when he does notice that or she notices that, then you can tell him the reason why. You see, obviously Laban has forgotten this. Or perhaps it's just a ruse. It was a ruse to cause Jacob to, to trust him. Or maybe it was both. We don't know the heart of Laban at this point in time. But Laban's a lost man. He's not saved. And you know what? He's forgotten about the things of the blessings of God. All he sees is the dollar signs now. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If you've got a, a bad boss, if you've got a boss, you know, I have been very fortunate. I've never had real bad bosses. I've had people I've worked with who have been pretty bad. Now, that's not Sue. I'm not talking about Sue. <laughs> but I have worked with people that I had to be careful and I had to trust. And I had to, you know, I used to pray Psalm 35 all the time because I just didn't, didn't, some people was trying to, brought the world right into the church. But let me say this to you, folks. If God is for us, who can be against us? You say, well, they're getting ready to fire me. Well, you know what? God's going to open another door for you. Don't be afraid of that. God is for you, beloved. The watchword for you is trust. Trust in him. We see his intentional con uh, conniving. We see his deceitful abilities. Laban knows and has full confidence in his ability as the consummate con man. You can't out-con an old con man, Laban says. And you know what? It wasn't within Jacob's power to do so. Jacob was no match for Laban. He really, really wasn't. We see Laban's decisive advantage. He's overcome Jacob before, and he says, I'll do it again. He knew Jacob's weakness. Jacob had been there for 20 years, for goodness sake. Jacob knew his weakness, or he knew Jacob's weakness. He likes family. He likes, he thinks I'm on his side. Laban thought he had him. Laban's sly pretense. But look at verse 35. We see Laban's sordid precaution. By the way, Psalm chapter 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You say, how come bad people get away with things? Folks, they don't get away with things. It is God's love and mercy and grace that allows them to even walk today. Folks, we need to pray for our lost bosses. We need to pray for our lost employees. We need to pray for those we work for and work with. Look at verse 35, Laban's sordid precaution. He has a decision with the flocks or about the flocks. Look what he does in verse 35. He separates the spotted ones. He said, okay, I know how this works. His first, his first step is simple. I'll remove the spotted and striped ones. They can't mate with the other ones if I do that. And though there will be no spotted or striped flocks. You see, they never read about the monk. The monk hadn't been there yet. Mendelssohn and his smooth peas and his wrinkled peas hadn't come in the textbooks yet. And so they had not known about the smooth and the wrinkled peas and the DNA and all the different recessive and uh, uh, all the good stuff that they taught you in biology. The bottom line was Laban knew if you got a bunch of striped animals in the flock, you're going to have a few striped ones. You're going to have a few spotted ones. So the old kidneys got working here. He said, I'll remove the spotted and the striped ones and they'll all be white and black. No problem. So we see here his plan of assurance, further showing Laban's intention. He is trying to prevent further opportunity for Jacob to have a flock. 
We see his purpose for his assignment. Obviously, Jacob isn't real family, is he? This is his son-in-law, for goodness sake. Now, I, I tell you, I'll be honest with you. I had a wonderful, wonderful mother-in-law. I never got in trouble with my mother-in-law. I really did. I had a wonderful... I, in fact, she's perfect today. She's in heaven today, and I have a perfect mother-in-law. I haven't seen her for years. But anyway, one day I will see her face to face. I tell you, I got to do her funeral. The first thing I said was, what a mother-in-law to give me the last word. Who thought, you know? <laughs> but I got a perfect mother-in-law. And, you know, I, I worked with my father-in-law for five years. Now, that was a stretch. I want you to understand. Bless his heart. But I want you to understand, though, never was I treated poorly, badly, mean, never tried to cheat me. This is family, for goodness sake. Obviously, he wasn't real family to Laban. He removes the animals from the general flock and attempts to prevent Jacob for having the, the flock that he was supposed to have for his wages. He tried to cheat him. You ever have a boss like that? You ever have a boss that tried to cheat you? Put your hand down, see. You ever had a boss that tried to cheat you? <laughs> the bottom line, folks, is this was his purpose. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, and the Lord directs his steps. See, Laban thinks he's in charge. <laughs> but what Laban doesn't understand, God's in charge. You say, you don't know my boss I work for, and I, I don't know your boss, but I know his boss. You see, the guy, the guy down in Texas? No, I'm talking about the guy in heaven. I'm talking about God our Father. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus himself. I'm talking about the one who moves all the steps of mankind. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. God will take care of you. Laban's plan versus Jacob's plan was really Laban's plan versus God's plan. So do not be afraid of what they can do or what they say. Folks, all my life, I lived in the real world. I worked in the real world. I was in the Marine Corps. I met all kinds of crazy people there. I met people who thought they were my God. And you know what? We had a theological problem. They thought they were God and I didn't. But you know, the bottom line is I worked at IUPU. I worked for construction companies. I worked for places just like you, and I know exactly what you go through. But let me say this to you folks. God's plan is still in effect. We see his distribution with the family. Laban says, okay, I've made a decision with the flocks. Now I'm going to make a distribution with the family. The scheme for his sons is I'm going to let my sons prosper, and I'm going to give a strategy for my son-in-law. I'm going to take the sheep away from him. Again, how does Laban feel about Jacob's place in the family? Can I say this to you? Can I be very honest with you? The world is not your friend. I don't care what you do or what you say. I don't care what you think you've got to do to make them like you. You're not going to do it. The world, Jesus said, marvel not that the world hates you. It hated me first. All you've got to do is bear the name of Jesus in your life and they will hate you. The issue is don't you hate them. You love them. You love them in Jesus. Genesis 12, 3 says, I'll bless those who bless you. Laban forgot. God said, I'll bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curseth you. Laban forgot about the covenant blessing that had gone from Abraham to Isaac and now to Jacob. And in verse 36, we see Laban's supplemental prevention. He even takes it further. The certainty of Jacob's distance. We see an oppressive scheme. He says, not only am I going to take the flock away from him, but just in case he sneaks over at night. That's why, daddies, you put a lock on the window of your daughter's room. Just in case Jacob comes by and takes some of my sheep, I'm going to take him three days journey away. Now that's a long distance. That's a very long distance, even in biblical standards. So we see an oppressive scheme here, but we see something 
here that Laban is not counting for. We see an, an oppressive scheme, but we see an omni, um, um, uh, omnipresent sovereign. God is everywhere. So you push Jacob three days away. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Many years ago, I was in the Marine Corps, and I, I basically found my first sergeant on Cinderella Liberty coming out of a bar with a blonde, and his wife was not blonde. And, and Top knew I was a Christian, and he thought I was going to call his wife. And so he decided to treat me in a different fashion. And I thought, well, you know, if I knew all this stuff, why do you want to treat me bad? That, that doesn't make sense. But he put me in the bathroom. He put my desk above the bathroom, and I had the toilet there underneath my, they put a field desk. I had a toilet underneath my desk. I had my file cabinet in the shower. I thought, what have I done to do this? And he came and told me, he says, because you would tell my wife. And I said, I said, first of all, I'm not here to ruin your marriage. You are. You're doing pretty good yourself. Why do I have to do this? But you see, that's the way the world thinks. The world thinks I've got to do this to you. And we see Laban's supplemental program here. He tries to prevent it. But there is a God. Romans 8.35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Later on, he said, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Folks, listen. No matter what you go through at work, no matter what you go through with your family, no matter what you go through in life, there is a greater, greater power in God, and he is omnipotent, and he is omnipresent in your life. We see the confirmation of Jacob's dedication, the testimony of Jacob's faithfulness. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, it simply says, Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. Most people would say, huh, you're going to do this to me? I'm not going to do any work for you. I'm going to do the least amount of work that I possibly can. You've cheated me, and I'm not going to do enough. Listen, folks, there's too many people today who are greedy themselves and say, my boss doesn't pay me enough money, so I'm going to not do a work for him. I'm going to steal from him. I'm going to do all that stuff for him. Listen, as a Christian, don't ever let that philosophy be in you whatsoever. You do the work as if you are working for Jesus. I preach my message as if Jesus is sitting right here on the front row, and I believe that he is here today. I don't preach my message, what anyone thinks or thought or think I should, but I do it because of what the Lord would have me to do. Now, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly or nasty or stupid to anybody. I believe the Lord would give me a message that would give you strength and encouragement and love. But folks, you're working not for the boss that you work for. You're working for Jesus. The Bible says whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you're on an assembly line or whether you work at a desk or whether you work on a computer or whether you work wherever you work, do it all to the glory of God. What does that mean? Jesus is your boss. And if you work that way, you're going to be a blessing to your boss. So we see the testimony of Jacob's faithfulness. We see the trust of Jacob's faith. His trust was not in Laban. His trust was in the Lord. Don't put your trust in Uncle Laban. Put your trust in the Lord. The world will always try to prevent you from living for Christ. The world will always do everything it can. Do not be shocked at work when the world tries to get you to do what you do to not be doing it for Christ. They want you to not, not to live for Christ. They want you not to be successful in your Christian life. However, in Psalm 56, 11, it says, In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? Well, they can fire me, preacher. Well, yeah, they can. They can fire you. But you know what? I believe God will not let you go fired for a long time. I lost my job during, during the Carter administration. 
I don't know if you remember that during the Carter administration, everybody lost, a lot of people lost their jobs. I lost my job during the Carter administration. And at the same time, International Harvester, just a little bit after that, decided they were going to pull out of Fort Wayne. Do you know what that was like trying to find a job? It was very difficult, but I always trusted God. We were always provided for. I never went hungry. My children were all taken care of, all of that. I had to beg a man for, and promise him that I would work for him for three years to get a, a job that was just paying minimum wage. Because he said, I know you'll leave me. As soon as you get a job back at IUP, you, you're going to leave. And I said, listen, if you give me a job, I promise you, what do you need? What, what time do you need? And he said, I need three years. I, I start making money. And I said, then I'll give you three years. And I gave him three years. And you know what? God blessed me for that. God opened a door that no man could close. It was a long three years. It was a hard three years. I thought God had put me in the back shelf, but all he was doing was preparing me for the top shelf. Let me say this to you folks. Trust in God. In God I've put my trust. Last we see Jacob's, a plan for Jacob's opportunity. Now this is where it really gets bizarre. In verse 37 through 39, we see Jacob's peculiar process. It was a strange procedure. What do you mean, preacher? Well, there are some people who believe, some commentary, and I don't agree with them, but some commentary believe that Jacob was trying to promote the change within the womb by making the striped trees in front of the animals so as they ate and, and as they procreated in front of these trees that the, the babies would somehow be striped or spotted. But you know, that's not true. The little wrinkled peas and the little smooth peas don't work that way. And the bottom line was simple with this. I don't believe it was that doing that at all. We'll talk about that in a second. Look at verse 37. The flocks were attracted. What happened? Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and the almonds and a chestnut tree, peeled white strips in them, and exposed the white which is in the rods. So he exposed these things. They were attracted to these trees that he had set up here where he's going to feed them. Now they, he stripped the bark. He did many things with these trees. He set it up so either it was the sight or the smell or the, even the taste. You've seen animals lick on trees, haven't you? Maybe it was the taste that drew those animals there. But we see in verse 38, their fertility was advanced. What do you mean, preacher? Look again. And the rods which had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs, where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. Now that word conceive there in the Hebrew is the word yakam. Yakam. And that word means literally to be hot. We would say it this way, to be in heat. And so the striped trees, look again at verse 38, let's read it right. And the rods which he had peeled, and he set before the flocks in the gutters in the watering trough. He put the stuff in the watering trough where the flocks came to drink so that they should be in heat. So some way this increased that opportunity for that animal to be in heat, to get ready to conceive. So this was some type of fertility thing. I don't know this is what, what it looks like it is. So the word here found, which means to be in heat, did this process involve the fertility of the animals? Was it the sight or the smell or the taste? God brought the right sheep and goats, the right ones that would, would come to this, and he brought them to drink and to eat, and Jacob provided the rest. Now you say, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Well, have you ever thought about how weird it is to throw fertilizer on your ground to make it grow? Do you know what fertilizer is? I smell it all the time in the springtime. Who would do that with the who thought who thought of that first? Whom? What can I do for this? Oh, hey, let's go. <laughs> what? Somebody must have said, "What are you doing?" We see in verse thirty-nine. Not only was it a strange procedure, but it was a supernatural plan. What do you mean? You see, it was God's miraculous design. Was it simply just a miracle of God? Perhaps it was God's handiwork. We see here God's manipulation of the DNA of these animals. You see, obviously these animals had either a 
recessive or a dominant gene in their body that was made for the spotted ones and God allowed for those to be in the flock. And so when that recessive gene, even a recessive gene, one out of four is going to be spotted. And so Jacob had a wild and crazy flock going, going, going wild and crazy, having babies all over the place. And so that one of four was absolutely going to be spotted or something. So even with that, the quality produced, or the quantity produced, produced the quality he wanted. Psalm 27, 11 says, teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. God's going to take care of you. God's going to provide. God knew what he was doing. Jacob saw white goats, white sheep, or white sheep and black goats, and lo and behold, the white sheep made it, and they had spots and, and stripes. Why? Because it was God's plan. God made them that way. Perhaps it was some type of inducement for fertility. I don't know. But whatever it was, it worked. God had a plan, did he not? But look at Jacob's practical proceeding. Once this happened in verse 44 through 43, Jacob did some practical things. By the way, God does bless you, folks. And God also gives you a brain. Use it. Well, I'm just waiting for God to bless me more. Don't wait. Take the blessing that God has given you, use it, apply it to your life, and God will bless you the more. Well, if I read my Bible, you know, it's like the guy who said to his wife, well, I told you I loved you 28 years ago. How many times I got to tell you? You know, oh, preacher, I read my Bible through, you know, many years ago. Well, duh, read it again. Apply what God's given you and do what God would have you to do. Look at verse 41 and 42, Jacob's favorable process. In verse 41, the separation of flocks. He takes those flocks away now. It came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. Okay, he continued to do this. He separated the flocks. Verse 42, we see his selection of the flocks. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. That was Jacob's plan. That was Jacob's requirement. This is the wage. He's not cheating Laban. This is the wage he asked for, and he's just doing what he's supposed to be doing. God had given him wisdom. God has given you wisdom, folks. Use it for his honor and glory. God has given you talents. God has given you gifts. Use it where you're at at work. But don't forget to use it in God's house. You see, that's what's the problem with most Christians today. God has given you abilities. God has given you talents. God has given you gifts. Every one of you have a gift that God has given you to use for his honor and glory in the church house. But see, God is not a monster who says you can't use it for work. And so many of us have used the talents and the gifts that God has given us to make a living in our lifetime, and we have failed to bring it back to the church and bless the people of God with it. Now, what's wrong with that? You see, God says, I want you to use your talents and your abilities to make a living. God doesn't want you to be poor, naked, and blind. God says, I want you to, to, to make a living for yourself. But what about all those people all over the world? Folks, they don't live in a Christian nation. God has blessed our nation. Don't let the politicians or the Hollywood crowd tell you any different. This country was blessed by God because we were and are and will be a Christian nation. They can't take that from us. It's in our history books. It's history. It's in our documents. It's in everything we are. They can say what they want to. They can rewrite all what they want. But we know and they know the truth. Live for God. We see Jacob's favorable process. But look at verse 43. Jacob's fortunate prosperity. Now, preacher, are you going prosperity preaching on me? No, I'm not. You see, what you may count as rich may not be rich to the other guy. You see, people overseas think you're rich when you go over there. You go over there, man, they think you're money bags. I remember years ago when I was in Brazil, I went to, we went to take Deborah's uh, aunt, who is our translator, to the, the beauty parlor. Now, why wives, women call it a beauty parlor, I don't know. They're beautiful before they go there. They just get, I guess, a good checkup. But anyway, 
I decided, you know, well, you know, I hadn't had a manicure for a while, so I thought I'd, uh, this little girl came up to me speaking Portuguese. I didn't know what she said, but she did nails, so I said, okay. I let it happen, so I sat down there, and she took my hand and did all the stuff, and so I, after I was done, I paid her, and then I tipped her. Well, that's the right thing to do. She screamed. I mean, the whole place was filled with her scream. Her aunt jumped up. I mean, it, curlers and everything jumped up. What's going on? Run over there. What'd you do? What'd you say? And I said, hey, I didn't say anything. What'd you do? I gave her one of these. She says, you did what? It was an equivalent of a dollar. I gave her some money, the Brazilian money, that the equivalent was a dollar. I thought, well, that's, you know, basically the cost was very minimal, so I'll just give her a dollar. I was giving her way far more than 20%. She screamed because that was a week's worth of tips. Everybody wanted to do my nails again. We went to the mall that same day. I bought some, some cologne for the men, for our Christmas gifts for the men, that was mainly a Brazilian fragrance. I bought, I think it was eight bottles of cologne, and the lady said to me, this is the biggest order I've ever done in the mall. I was shocked. I was shocked to see the difference. Folks, you are money bags. God has blessed you so much. That if you went around the world to see, you would be shocked what, how much God has blessed you with. You would be overwhelmed to understand that the things you have been given that you could use to bless other people. God has blessed you. You are rich, folks. Wealth is not a sin. We see here in verse 43, Jacob's success. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous. That's not sinful. He became prosperous. Look at Jacob's servants. And he had large flocks, female and male servants. He had servants. And camels and donkeys. He had a stock of other animals, not just sheep and goats. He was able to buy some camels and some donkeys. You see, being wealthy isn't a sin. It's what we do with it that's the sin. What do you mean, preacher? 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of the money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's the truth. It's not the money that's evil, folks. It's the love of money. Listen to the rest of it. For some have strayed from their faith in their greediness. That's why God doesn't let some of us have a lot of money. Because they stray in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. You say, well, God, why aren't you blessing me? Why can't I have a million dollars? Why can't I be like so-and-so down the street? God says, I can't do it. It would destroy you. But yet he has given you the wealth that we have in the world. If you would go anywhere in the world, they would think you were wealthy. So rather than saying to yourself, oh, I need more, I need more, I need more, say to yourself, how can I do other things to help other people so that I can get more? God bless me that I might bless others. Conclusion, real quick. Let's turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We used to teach this in our newlywed class, this particular portion of Scripture. But I thought it was rather applicable to our message today. Timothy trusted Timothy. Jacob trusted God. And God helped him to be a prosperous man. If I could take you to some of the places in this world, we went some places in, in, in Sao Paulo that was absolutely unbelievable. People living with dirt floors, living with tin roofs and cardboard for walls. And yet they loved God. And yet they did many things. One lady walked 20 miles to go to church at night. 20 miles one way and walked back. And we asked her why she was so happy. And she said, because I have a testimony in my, in my community. You are wealthy, folks. By the world standard, God has blessed you. You could have been born anywhere. You could have been born in Africa. You could have been born in India. You could have been born in mainland China. You could have been born in North Korea. But God chose this country and this place so that you could be a blessing to others. You see that Jacob's success was not just in animals, but he also was a blessing to other people. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
and verse 6 through 8. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the great confession in the presence of many witnesses. Folks, God will, does, and will continue to bless you if you live for him. And that's the secret. The secret is living for God. You're already rich. Folks, where we're going, the streets, they pave it with gold. And the richness is not in the gold. What what is God's economy based on? God's economy is not based on gold. God's economy is based on people. You are God's treasure. The people of this world are God's treasure. Your boss is God's treasure. Yes, they're lost. Your neighbor, yes, they're lost. Your friends, yes, they're lost. But that's the treasure of God. And we are to reap the harvest. As Jesus said, as the fields are widened to harvest. And we are to go and to get that which God deems precious. And to bring to him. Oh, are you willing to be righteous for God? Are you willing to be rich for God? The bottom line is Jacob was. No matter what scheme was brought against Jacob, God blessed him. You want to be blessed by God? Live for him. Don't wait. Say, preacher, I'm waiting for the big one to come in, and when I get that first million, then I'll live for God. That's backwards. Live for God now, and God will bless you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you that Jacob went through the times, went through the troubles, went through the temptations, went through all those things, and you were faithful to bring about his blessing. And Father God, help us to understand today before we leave this place that you are faithful. The Labans of life, They have their plans, but Father God, you are faithful. Oh, Father, if we would but live for you, you are faithful. And Father God, if there's someone here today that is seeking your direction, seeking your your will in their life, Father God, open doors that no man can close and let them see the doors that are opened by you. And then, oh, Father God, if there's someone here today, whether they're a church member or visitor, who are not born again, Father God, this would be the opportunity. Your Holy Spirit has already spoke to them. They'd come and take me by the hand. You'd show them in the Bible how they could be saved. And Father God, there are those who have family members, friends, bosses that need to be prayed for. And Father, instead of fighting, we need to pray for them. And oh, Father God, if we would but come, I know you would be a blessing to us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray.